we did. We'd initially thought we might have maybe um, 50 or less people on this on this on this call. And I can see right now that we have a, a much larger number of uh, 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 people who express interest. And given the amount of time we have, um, it's unlikely that we'll be able to really get to all the information we'd like uh, people to share. So I would encourage people that had uh, particularly um, technical contributions or uh, questions that they, they would like answered by people that have technical background um, after the Zoom is over to, to consider uh, asking your questions or making contributions on the uh, listserv, which is linked to our, um, we also have a web page that um, on, on, if you go to the kionline.org main page, there's a tab called cor coronavirus. And if you go to the coronavirus uh, web page directly, there's a, a link to, to issues about vac vaccine manufacturing. And, and if you go to that page, then there's uh, some links to some additional resources. One, there's a spreadsheet that Ariana Schutten has has created, which lists and it's it's a work in progress. It lists manufacturing facilities that we're aware of that are either currently engaged in, in manufacturing vaccines or uh, there's some speculative capacity that they might have. And the second uh, spreadsheet was created by um, uh, uh, Louise uh, Abinader, who's uh, uh, who, who also works with us. And uh, Louisa Sheet just looks at uh, when we've been able to identify outsourcing contracts, it gives some metadata on the outsourcing contracts, including one thing of, of interest to people is how long it took from when the contract was announced to when they were actually be able to bring production online since the timing of how, how long it takes uh, to transfer manufacturing know-how or rights. Uh, uh, takes from from an, having an agreement and actually having things up and running and producing uh, products. Uh, the format today uh, is designed to be informal. We have an agenda uh, that uh, lists. I'm going to take a quick look at it. We list uh, eight different topics, and the the uh, approach was to go uh, start at the first and just work our way through the nine things. It's supposed to be done. Within two hours, I don't mind if we go a little bit over, but I think a lot of people probably have a lot of other things scheduled. So we'll do our best to stay within the two hour time frame. And because we have right now 102 people on the call right now, and there's more joining all the time, uh, uh, some of our original expectations about um, uh, the way we'd run things has to be, um, we, we have to accept the fact that uh, we're gonna have to ask people to be fairly concise and a lot of what we'll probably accomplish on this call is um, uh, introducing uh, many of the people that have it, uh, insights and perspectives on this issues um, and people get a chance to sort of uh, meet each other. And um, I know that this won't be an opportunity to do a complete drill down on every topic we have in here or to, or, or to, or to get everyone's perspective to the degree that we would have preferred um, had it been a, a smaller group or if we had more time. I'm uh, just doing the math on the time and the number of uh, participants. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, with this first item on the agenda. Well, first, before I start, I just want to give people just if anyone has a question on the format, um, uh, uh, you could uh, uh, put something uh, also uh, just in terms of communications. Uh, Claire Cassidy is monitoring the chat on the on on the uh, on the Zoom, and she's trying to communicate with me to, uh, with me through to make sure I I'm paying attention to what she's watching. So if you have a request, um, um, uh, oh, somebody gave a a, a good note about. Um, yeah, the bandwidth issues. If you have a, a request uh, to, uh, to, to speak or to make a thing, uh, put something in the, uh, you, can, you can put a message in the uh, chat and you can either address it, uh, you might wanna address it to Claire Cassidy who's listed as the host on the chat because Claire is sort of my manager uh, for this event. And she's the one that registered you for the event. So she will then flag it and make sure um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm paying attention. Um, 
So I, uh, the first thing I thought we were going to start, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to start with is the uh, question one is which vaccines represent uh, the most significant opportunities in terms of scaling manufacturing capacity or enhancing access. And on this issue, we had a number of people that we thought we would ask uh, to make some initial contributions. Um, and I, I wanted to start with uh, Martin Fried from WHO, if, if Martin's on the call right now. Martin, are, are you um, online right now? Can anybody see if Martin is on the line yet? Martin is gonna be joining us. I think Martin maybe expects to join us by um, 9.15. We'll also note that um, you are automatically muted when you have joined the call. So if you get called on to speak, please make sure to unmute yourself. Um, I'll wait I to see. I uh, he, he might be a little bit delayed. So give him some more minutes. All right, fine. I'm gonna start then with, uh, is Ingrid uh, Crowman from Sepi, is she, is she on the call right now? She's yes, I am. This is Ingrid Crowman from Sepi. Uh, I, I was just wondering if, um, if, if, uh, if, if you mind if I ask you to share a few thoughts on this first topic, which is which vaccines represent the most significant opportunities in terms of scaling manufacturing and enhancing access. And maybe you could start very succinctly just explaining what CEPI is for people that are not familiar with what you are, and then uh, address this first topic on the agenda. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ingrid Krohmann. I'm head of CMC at the uh, CEPI. CEPI stands for Correlation for Epidemic oh, Invasion. Oh, 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 also, also uh, you, you, you can uh, go ahead and uh, turn your video on too. I mean, when you speak, okay. that would be nice for people. Thank okay. you. And, uh, yeah, and CEPI's role in, in this uh, pandemic uh, has very much been to uh, to support uh, vaccine developers uh, and and the vaccine has, developers has, uh, in the other way, uh, approved that the an eligible uh, criteria and securing access for all those who need the vaccine so they can have the vaccines. So we have uh, supported uh, uh, until now 10 different vaccine developers from uh, uh, various uh, platforms. So both uh, uh, viral vector vaccines, subunit vaccines, uh, inactivated vaccines, uh, and the adenovirus vectors uh, vaccines. So, and and uh, the way we operate is that um, it's a vaccine manufacturer who uh, develops the vaccines, and and we are more in a, in a supporter role. We did see already last year that uh, or foresee that perhaps there will be a lack of capacity and, and uh, manufacturing capacity. And we made a, an expression of interest uh, uh, last uh, autumn. And we got uh, several responses back, both for drug substance uh, uh, capacity and for drug product capacity. And what we experienced was that uh, uh, the, by the responses we got was that there was a uh, more or most capacity for subunit vaccines for protein uh, based uh, vaccines and uh, uh, RNA vaccines there was uh, not much capacity for those uh, for the viral vector vaccines uh, we did uh, see some uh, uh, capacity but for the drug product uh, the BSL2 was a, a limiting uh, factor and uh, for DNA vaccines uh, uh, was also quite some uh, uh, CDMOs uh, available for, for that so that's what we tried to create was a kind of a network then then the the developers could uh, come to us and uh, and then uh, ask us if if we could match them up with with the uh, uh, CDMO and in that way increase uh, their capacity and and uh, support their tech transfer. So that's how we have uh, operated uh, in this field. Uh, yeah, when looking at manufacturing, over. 
uh, th 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 thank you very much. I think we're going to go through a few initial uh, interventions from people and then and then open it up to questions. But before we do that, I'd like to ask, is uh, Aileen uh, Ashanani from MSF? And I'm sure I mispronounced, I'll mispronounce probably half the people's names. That's my bad. But uh, um, is Ellen, uh, Ellen, uh, Ellen Ashanani? Alain El Sahani from uh, MSF. Yes, I'm sorry. Are you are you in the call right now? Yes. Hi, I'm. I'm on the call. Can you? Uh, uh, do you have a few uh, perspectives on this question of which vaccines you think are most significant opportunities for scaling up of manufacturing? Yeah. Sure. Maybe I can give a few insights from our current thinking at uh, at uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, basically, what what we we are seeing today is that um, compared to to six months ago, we, we clearly have some vaccines that seem to be more uh, adapted to the needs in low and middle income countries, um, and some vaccines also with the new variants that seem to be more interesting. So I think we we're also trying to include these um, criteria uh, in in our current thinking. Uh, in terms of platform, and, and this is obviously, I mean, we have much, much less knowledge in this area than than, than CEPI, but but it seems to us that, um, I mean, the mRNA platform is clearly getting a lot of uh, attention uh, because of, of what seems to be a, a, a more, uh, let's say, a sim simpler uh, manufacturing process. Uh, this is based of, on, on the limited information that we have so far, because uh, as you all know, the, the uh, scale up of mRNA is something that is really recent, and it only uh, happened in the in the in the last uh, six months. And this information is not uh, widely av available. I mean, we we've seen uh, a couple of publications from people like the Imperial College that try to describe a bit the process and what is needed um, for it. But our assumption today is is to 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 think that the mRNA is is actually the most interesting platform to uh, tech transfer, not only because of this uh, potential simplicity, but because also the, the process itself potentially doesn't require the kind of infrastructure knowledge uh, and uh, that, that, that you need for, for vaccine manufacturing. Uh, so we know from, from our work on, on WHO pre-qualified vaccine manufacturers that the capacity and the number of um, um, stakeholders that you have out there is actually quite limited. So you have, for instance, if we look at developing country vaccine manufacturers, only 22 of them ha are are listed uh, uh, on the WHO uh, website as having uh, WHO pre-qualified vaccines. And actually, most of them have only one or two vaccines. And it's a very limited number, maybe you know five manufacturers that have a bigger port portfolio. And I, I mean. Again, when you look also at the units of supply division, for instance, data on how vaccine supply um, has been working in the last 20 years, you see clearly that when it comes to the DCVMNs, uh, the, the most of the, of the supply is actually coming from one country, which is India, and and most of it again is coming from one manufacturer, which is Serum of India, uh, which is already busy doing to to you know uh, developing and manufacturing two vaccines. So. Given the, the limited amount, amount of actors, what we're also trying to kind of uh, figure out is whether for the particular case of mRNA, and this is based on what we've seen, for instance, for Lonza with uh, Moderna, what we've seen with Bayer, uh, with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with CureVac, or BioNTech, you know, setting up its own production capacity uh, based on a, on on, this, on on a manufacturing side that was, uh, um, I think it was it was Novartis' manufacturing side. So all these are examples of companies that didn't didn't have uh, manufacturing capacity for vaccines per se. So so the assumption that we are making is that if this is true also for some, you know, for a number of manufacturers that are based in countries like India, you know, uh, South Africa, uh, China, that deal with biological products, but not necessarily vaccines, uh, if these actors can potentially start also manufacturing uh, mRNA vaccines, obviously provided that we have some kind of tech transfer happening, then you just open the door for a, a completely you know, new production capacity that does not exist, for instance, for for in 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 in, the, in in what we've seen so far in terms of you know production capacity surveys that we've seen because they were really focused on on vaccine manufacturers. Um, 
so, so that's that's a bit the idea is that we this would the mRNA technology might actually allow for a paradigm shift because we actually have a number of manufacturers, you know, who produce for instance insulin or other biological products that have the GMP experience that is needed for them to be you know able to to pass the standards of the WHO, uh, and that today are not accounted for uh, be, because they are not they don't have you know uh, a track record of vaccine production. Um, over. Uh, that was really great. Uh, I, I, I'd like to um, uh, now uh, ask us. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to say uh, Amy, uh, Amy and Kamian. I'm, I'm saying this wrong. I'm sorry. From Canada, uh, uh, Professor um, Professor Kamian from Canada. Are you? Are you? Uh, you're on the call right now, right? Could you turn on your audio and, and your video? Correct. Thank and you. Could you uh, and could you just briefly introduce yourself and, and what your background is? And then I, I believe you have some insights into issues about um, messenger uh, RNA manufacturing for vaccines. Thank you for the invitation. I will try to be brief. I'm working at the uh, bioengineering department at McGill University, but most of my uh, career was at the uh, National Research Council of Canada over 25 years. Unfortunately, I don't have a direct insight on the messenger RNA technology, although, uh, I mean, I have the, the, the basic knowledge. I'm more on the virus vector side, actually, adenovirus, uh, VSV. Uh, so, but I 100% agree with the uh, what has been said just by Alain, that this is how uh, we can foresee actually the uh, messenger RNA technology. That's essentially it's chemistry as compared to biological manufacturing where you would need to have a cell line for replicating eventually the virus for producing the recombinant protein, and even as a basic for making the inactivated vaccines. So the potential of adapting is certainly with the messenger RNA technologically uh, more easy. <laughs> However, I think everyone realized that uh, there is uh, significant uh, know-how behind that would require uh, a, 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 an approach of licensing uh, that will eventually make it available. Um, beside the messenger RNA, the, 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 uh, the required technology would be essentially making uh, micro emulsion, which is the lipid nanoparticle, which is once again, a chemistry approach. So that's, that's the, the reason, and I, I fully support that idea of technological jump uh, in the context actually of uh, rapid, uh, although I need to, to reiterate that my expertise is more on the viral vector delivery system. So with this, I think uh, I will stop here. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, that was really helpful. I'd like to call on um, uh, uh, Fabrizio. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm always struggling with the uh, with the pronunciation of names. Um, Fabrizio uh, Kyoto. Yeah, hey. <laughs> that's right. Who's a who's a, a very distinguished professor uh, uh, working in Amsterdam at the university uh, and, and also in Havana. Uh, are, are you available right now to uh, turn on your audio and your video and, and share? Yes, and share I think I did it. Yes. So go right ahead. So, yes, first of all, thanks for the consideration. And uh, it's more than an honor to discuss with people like you. And uh, yes, I'm young and um, I'm maybe the one with less experience than all of you. Um, I've been working uh, with Cuba and for Cuba in the last years. But here I'm just describing uh, the scientific part when we have to design vaccines, especially in the idea of manufacturing. So 
Um, although I think there are no good vaccines and bad vaccines, um, from your perspective, I think that a solid and valid look at subunit vaccines should be uh, the main goal. Um, in my experience, in our experience, uh, I think focusing on uh, fighting for license sharing and ex expanding the production of mRNA vaccines or uh, others uh, could be not maybe the, the good strategy. There, among the subunit vaccines, that is, they are the 30% of the vaccine in clinical trial, there is not only Novavax from USA. There are vaccines in China or in Cuba that they are starting phase three. The price will be super low, uh, although the technology is super innovative. And we're talking about two ingredients, uh, very, very easily to scale up. So um, from my perspective, what I learned in a country like Cuba is that you always look to have to look at the future. And of course, I'm no one compared to your experience to give you suggestions. But uh, we have to consider other options. At some point, uh, convalescent people will need a boost. What's going on with a third doses of an mRNA vaccine? What will happen with a third doses of an adenoviral vector? We don't know. What will happen? in the pediatric uh, cohorts, what will happen between five and 19 years old? And also, why if at some point we will ask for a third or a fourth doses to keep high the level of neutralizing IgG to have a better hope to neutralize the variants, for example. So I do think in my humble experience uh, in designing a uh, vaccine uh, with or for Cuba, that a valid and strong focus on subunit vaccines, not only the Novavax, that is a, let's say, Lamborghini type of uh, subunit vaccines, should be one of the important focus of the top level colleagues that you are. Again, uh, it's not about uh, the moment, it's to look uh, at the future uh, for the other need. Um, so yeah, here I read something. So yes, at the moment, the clinical trial of the subunit are all with uh, two uh, shots, but Cuba is already doing a, a clinical trial with a third doses to see what is happening. So if at, in the future, everyone will need, maybe we will combine vaccines. Maybe you will have two shots of Pfizer and then after six months, you're gonna need a subunit one. Is a cheap approach is a safe approach. Is among all the books of vaccinology, subunit vaccines are the safest one. And also in this context, I, see, I think, to have also a extra weapon against the variants and for the pediatric uh, community, I do think that a valid focus on all the other subunit vaccines should be uh, one of the concrete uh, reality for the future. Thanks. Could you, could, could you before I, I switch off from you, uh, could you share, just share some insights into the practical um, challenges in scaling manufacturing from the originators, for example, either Novavax or Cuba or a Chinese manufacturer to uh, someone that's never done it before? So, well, again, I'm an academic. I, I, well, I visit, I know how does it work uh, from the product to the scale up. But what I can mention to you is that, for example, a receptor binding domain that is a dimer of the receptor binding domain at Sorbon Alumia. This is in phase three in China. This is, is the cheapest old school, maybe I three, I read the data of phase one shoot. This is working. So this should be a focus for a third shot. This should be a focus for the pediatric things. Also the Cuban approaches, although they are innovative because the Soberana 2 is the only conjugate vaccine in the world apparently also novel in the history of vaccinology, small protein onto a big protein, on tetanus toxoid. This approach can be easily scaled up. These are two ingredients. Also the other Soberana one, these are two ingredients. So there are a lot of um, approaches. Among the subunit ones, it's not only Novavax, uh, fantastic approach, I do love, I mean, I'm a scientist, I do love all this futuristic nanoparticulated approach. But if we want to be concrete, if we want to look at a third dosis of a fourth dosis, and if you want to look at the children, have a look on what is the simplest uh, approaches. And th this literature is already showing some of those data. So it's just 
a part of just the receptor dimer receptor binding domain on on, it, on aluminum hydroxide side. This is already something interesting. And the scale up of this is easy and impressive. Technically, you need two ingredients and one machine. That's it. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, we're going to come back to this issue. Uh, I want to call right now on uh, uh, James Krellenstein. You know, I, James, am I sound? Uh, am I saying your last name correctly? <laughs> uh, it's Cullenstein, but it's uh, no worries. <laughs> can you can you start by just introducing yourself, and then um, uh, I know that you're going to talk about messenger RNA. So go right ahead. Right. So my name is James Cullenstein. I'm I'm uh, the executive director of a group called an advocacy group called Prep for All, and we we've historically focused on HIV, but we've been doing a lot of work on COVID since. Uh, last February. And I wanted to sort of before we dive into why we really think mRNA vaccines uh, are real, um, should be, you know, what we're focusing on a lot for global production scale up. I want to just take a second to look to step back and talk about what we're actually seeing uh, in the epidemic. Because I think as Fabrizio just said, you know, what we really need to be planning for now is a world in which we're going to have to be talking about sequential booster shots to uh, combat new variants. Obviously, we've seen the, the effects of a variant that was first detected in South Africa on the efficacy of both the AstraZeneca uh, adenoviral vector vaccine, as well as the Novavax sub, uh, subunit vaccine. And one of the things that I think is really important here is when we're looking at the reality of having to do multiple uh, booster shots or multiple new variant targeting vaccines, we need a production platform that can relatively easily switch from one antigen to a new antigen that's targeting that variant. And one of the things that immediately attracted us to messenger RNA platforms is that because of its nearly cell-free production process, switching out for a new antigen is just as simple as switching up the upstream template DNA. So unlike say for a subunit vaccine, where we'd have to re-engineer the recombinant protein production, re-engineer the cell line, re-engineer the baclovirus vector, and actually do all of that sort of process optimization in the cell line sort of uh, you know, recombinant pro protein production process. In mRNA vaccines, we can really switch it out in, little, in less than six weeks to a new uh, antigen target to a new, for a new variant. So this really gives us maximum flexibility. And on the flip side, what I think really concerns us right now is that we are right, the global production sort of commitments that we have is highly targeted, highly concentrated as of now in adenoviral vector vaccines. And not only are adenoviral vector vaccines pretty difficult to manufacture as we've seen, even on a very, very large scale, but they preclude the use of the same vector to sequentially uh, immunize somebody with that same vector. So what does that mean? If I got an AstraZeneca vaccine today and I got it with that Chad Ox one adenoviral vector, if I need to get a second or third you know, booster dose that targets a new variant, the efficacy of that, um, of that sequential uh, boost dose would be less because my body is both making a immune response to not only the antigen that the uh, viral vector codes for, but actually to the viral vector itself. This is why some vaccines like Sputnik V use two different adenoviral viral vectors. But what this really should give us a lot of alarm about is that when we're looking at a world in which 52% or roughly 50% of production capacity is concentrated in adenoviral vectors, and we're already seeing variants arising that are requiring us to re-engineer our vaccines, we need to think about pretty dramatically switching where our production capacity is. And we really think mRNA vaccines are not only highly efficacious, not only have a lot of attractiveness in the production platform, but they also probably have a pretty high genetic barrier to actually uh, to, to, new, to new viral variants. That's because mRNA vaccines, unlike subunit vaccines, can induce both a CD8 uh, positive T cell response and a CD4 T cell response. And where there's a lot of emerging evidence that the CD8 cytotoxic T cell control might actually be instrumental in preventing the development of new variants or conferring resistance to new variants, even with the existing vaccine. James, uh, do, do you mind if uh, I just want to 
I, my, my staff is telling me to, uh, to, to, to pay attention to the, they're looking at the, 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 the eight, eight, eight point uh, agenda. And I just want to just, we, we might come back to this issue because we have another uh, conversation on the third agenda item on manufacturing uh, capacity. But I, I think this is really uh, this question of uh, messenger uh, RNA because it's such a new technology. It's a, a, a really a deep amount of interest on this. And I know that people will really want to come back to this. Um, I, I think that Martin from the WHO is, uh, uh, had to, uh, he, he's going to be in and out of this call. We'll, I'd like to come back to him when he returns to the call. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do right now is uh, uh, ask, ask if uh, there's, a lot, there's been a lot of technical questions uh, in the chat uh, about the vaccine things, things. But the, the, I want to just sort of start with a lot of the agenda items and walk through those um, and because and, and, it covers a lot of topics that I think people will want to discuss. The next one is what incentives, mandates, and or subsidies are useful in expanding access to vaccine manufacturing and capacity. This goes to the issue of if we don't, if we don't have uh, enough capacity today and if people are are, are, are sitting on top of, uh, of know-how in manufacturing technology. I mean, put it in perspective, there's one, one set of issues that gets a lot, fair amount of attention is do people, are patents a, a problem? And do you want people to license the patents that may, may be important for people manufacturing so that manufacturers, if they make investments, won't, be, won't have to worry about not being able to sell their products or facing infringement claims. But I think most people understand also that the manufacturing know-how, the transfer of the manufacturing know-how itself is a different kind of a problem and it's really important. And it requires not just a, a government to lift the protection of the intellectual property, but requires a constructive engagement by the originator of the technology to literally train and share all kinds of information not related to patent rights necessarily to the new manufacturer. I know that CEPI itself has played a role in doing this within its own membership, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 some of this goes on in other. I know that this is part of the EU plan in terms of how they uh, plan to push out some manufacturing outsourcing agreements within the EU and Operation Warp Speed. But the, the, the particular question we want to examine right now are the incentives, mandates, or subsidies that are useful. In making this happen faster, uh, Paul uh, Fuller, are, are, are you on? Are you on the call right now? I should check to see if Paul's on on the call. I don't believe he is. Paul is. Uh, Paul for uh, uh, for nine years worked for Nervatus, and he was the uh, he was the head of all the intellectual property for Nervatus, uh, Nervatus when he left fairly recently. Um, he's one of the persons I was going to call on on this issue of the incentives. Um, uh, uh, one, one of the, uh, is, is, uh, is Kevin uh, McCarthy on the call right now from the European Commission? They were on before, let me check. Um, So is Kevin, is Kevin, uh, we, have we lost Kevin for right now? We have got off to a really strong start, but now we're, we have more participants, but some of the speakers I wanted to call in are, are probably multitasking. Uh, I don't see Kevin right now. Do you think, uh, sir, could you, could you reach out to Kevin to see if you can, you yeah, can I will. Re rejoin us? Um, uh, on this issue of, uh, of incentives, I'm going to open it up a bit, but I will say that one thing that, uh, but in the beginning, there was, I think, this idea that there would be appeals coming from governments that were funding research and development, and there would be uh, uh, civil society and, and, and the public in general encouraging people to openly license technology, uh, not just the patent rights, but also the know-how in manufacturing, because it's a big pandemic, and the idea was we really wanted to scale up fast. I don't think we want to dwell too much on why we want to scale up because I think people understand that on this call. But uh, I, I think we can also reflect on the fact that in the past year, 
uh, uh, the, the, the World Health Organization has set up a technology access pool, which we'll, we'll come back to. And that has not been successful so far in attracting voluntary agreements to share manufacturing know-how or intellectual property rights. And so the WHO uh, uh, so far has not been able to make that work in that area. The, the, the European Union has just announced a plan, uh, which the details are, we don't really have all the details yet, but uh, uh, where, where they, they, they envision that they'll be able to, to push out manufacturing, scaling manufacturing agreements. Um, and it, it's somewhat different than the European Union, I mean, than the WHO model. The WHO, I think, was more of an open licensing proposal, whereas the European Union is more one where there's restrictive licensing and a considerably more secrecy on know-how. So instead of sharing know-how to make vaccines, the European Union seems to have an approach where they're connecting subsidies that they're going to provide with a more restrictive control over the technology. And um, it's, it's our guess that for some of the existing vaccines out there, that may be a proxy, you know, that, that may be a realistic look at what you can do right now, given the fact that over the past year, billions of dollars were spent on research and development contracts that failed to include very good um, provisions regarding the sharing of manufacturing know-how. However, it also seems that if you're trying to move things forward in the future where you want more open platforms and you want more manufacturing know-how in the public domain, that you should not rely on the problems you had in the past, uh, the mistakes that you made in the past by not opening up the manufacturing technology, but you should try and have at least going forward a strategy to put more manufacturing technology in the public domain. And one thing that, that we think uh, you can really spend more time looking at are the economic incentives for doing so, including completely buying out technology. And I think the, 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 the to illustrate what, how that can be done, I mean, if, you, if just looking backwards, Pfizer bought its way into the messenger RNA uh, field by buying technology from, from, um, uh, uh, from, from BioNTech. And uh, there's a, a lot of the technology that's out there is from academics, it's from small companies, and it's from companies that themselves uh, are even bought and sold the whole company. The governments have a fair amount of money uh, if you if you aggregate them together, uh, and uh, but they're not really working together. But if they were working together, uh, it, it would strike me that there would be uh, considerable opportunities to uh, to to, uh, uh, to to essentially, if nothing else, if, if 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 mandates like the Defense Production Act are not invoked in the United States or other countries which have similar instruments merely just writing really big, large checks and not just for some regional access, but just to put manufacturing technology in the public domain. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm told that uh, um, that Mary Angela, uh, uh, Dr. Mar Mary Angela Simona from WHO is, is joining the call right now. And, I, and she was supposed to sort of be our, our, our keynote here, and um, uh, but she was on an emergency call and she's now joining the call. And I'd like to sort of go back to Mary Angela and, and invite her to uh, introduce herself and then talk a little bit about the, what the WHO is doing on the scaling of manufacturing, particularly as it relates to, um, particularly um, as it relates to the, the CTAP and the <coughs> qualification program. Mary Angela, do you mind uh, turning your video on and your audio on and-, and, and The video on. is, the. The video is on, Jamie. Good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and apologies, we just had a, a problem to solve, another problem to solve. Uh, it, I, Jamie, I got your question when you're already going through, and I believe Martin Fried from WHO will join in, a, in a, at four o'clock and can speak a little bit about the manufacturing, the work that WHO is planning to do on the manufacturing. If that's, if that's okay with you, I thought he was already on the call, but he's working with, uh, with us on CTAP and working with the other colleagues and he's prepared to, to address this issue. Okay, 
So it's a pleasure to be here and apologies. I, yesterday, Jamie and I were exchanging some notes because I, some emails because I, I didn't expect to be able to, to be able now to come here and do a, a formal uh, uh, opening remarks or anything, but just to participate on the panel and, and address the questions. I know there are issues regarding pre-qualification, there are issues rega regarding the not only the manufacturing of vaccines, but also the availability of vaccines. And this was the, the call that I was attending right now. And as we put uh, the allocation mechanism into into place and we are running the uh, the allocation of vaccines the the, the algorithm this today and and making the results public for monday so we are running on that so i i don't know jamie if you want me to address the quality assurance issues right now or you or if this was already discussed that would be great yeah. let, let me, thank you you, you know that WHO has issued an, uh, a call for expression of interest on, on COVID vaccine, vaccine candidates in October last year. We have on our site, and I'm happy to put it on the chat, we have on the COVID site, WHO COVID site, we have a, a weekly update on the status of the assessment of all vaccine candidates that have uh, have submitted expression of interest to WHO. You know that we we have Pfizer uh, uh, emergency use listed last uh, end of last year. We just uh, did the UAL on the 15th of uh, February, Monday this week for both AstraZeneca, uh, the site in Korea, and for the SII, the Serum Institute of India. Uh, and you, you need to understand that the AstraZeneca has several manufacturing sites, and for each of them, it requires a different uh, emergency use authorization. The conditional approval that EMA did in late, I think it was last week of uh, 29th of January, was for the two sites that will be manufactured in Europe. Uh, so WHO did receive the SII dossier in the 15th of January and did receive the last data for AstraZeneca SK by on the 29th of January. Now the both of them are, are listed for emergency authorization. And we're discussing with countries now how to, to do the, what are the, the hurdles and speeding up the local authorization either through import licensing or through uh, use of the uh, reliance mechanisms on the WHO's process to ensure that there is an authorization for this, these vaccines to enter the countries in March as was planned. We have, uh, we have other vaccines that we are assessing. We, we are assessing both Sinopharm and Sinovac from China, right? We have a, a team now finalizing the inspection on Sinovac. Sinopharm was inspected last week. So we should have a decision, you know, WHO works with a, with a technical advisor. We, we should have a decision on both these two Chinese vaccines in probably the first 15 days of March. Now the company like Sinopharm already received the report and they have to respond. And so we're expecting that the earliest is mid-March for the, for the two Chinese vaccines. They are not yet on the COVAX portfolio, but there are discussions uh, regarding Sinopharm already on pricing and, and availability and that else. I know there was a question last earlier this week when we 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 had another a discussion with civil society on on CTAP. There was a question about the Russian vaccine, and I'm I'm pleased to say that Gamalia. Finally, we had several meetings with Gamalia. Gamalia is the, the producer of uh, the research institute that produces the Sputnik vaccine. And on, on, we did not have access to the data on the GMP, on the good manufacturing practices from Gamalia until last week. So they have started to, they have uploaded their submission. The dossier has been uploaded and we will start assessing. Gamalia from 
next week. They fin they finalized this week. There are other vaccines that are on the COVAX portfolio and that will, will be, that are more advanced right now. You know that J&J &J vaccine for J&J, WHO does work with EMA. EMA, we still unsure it, whether they're gonna do the assessment and WHO is part of this assessment in early March or uh, later in, in March, last week of March. So we, we are waiting to see that. But then because of the abridged process, we can do the, the emergency use listing quicker. We, we do, do follow very closely with the EMA on J&J. &J. And Novavax, it's the other vaccine that's also on the COVAX portfolio and the SEPI portfolio. We is still in under discussions that if they are gonna submit to a EOL or not. So this, this is in a nutshell everything that's happening on the on the on the vaccine candidates that are phase two B or phase three that have submitted dossiers to WHO. You can find, and I'm glad to put on the chat uh, the status of each of these vaccines that is updated every week. Thank you, Jane. Uh, th thank you, and, and I think we will be coming back to, to WHO. That was really, really uh, useful information, and um, and I think all of us are uh, are really grateful that uh, that, that you're you're uh, doing that you're working on this issue and that you reached out. Has has a, has the WHO? I, I may have missed it, but um, have have you? Uh, do you have any relationships with the Cubans on the Cubans vac vaccine? Sorry, not yet because it requires to be. We, we have relationships with them, but not on the, the emergency use listing yet. No, because they need to be more advanced in the clinical trials. But that that's uh, it's definitely uh, Pahu is working with them, and we are very much following up the developments uh, with uh, their vaccine candidate. And as soon as they are able to to apply for an emergency use listing. Then what we, we have, Jamie, is what we call a rolling submission because they start to submit data, right? And as long as they have the efficacy and safety data, preliminary data, and that they have the manufacturing, the good manufacturing practices data, they would be ready to start. They haven't, they are not ready yet. Uh, Mary Angela, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to call on uh, um, Mara Martinez from the European Commission, uh, who's here also with Kevin McCarthy. But if uh, if both of them could uh, could join, uh, could turn on their audio and their, and their and their video. But I'd like to ask Mara first if she could explain uh, what the European uh, Commission is uh, is working on and what they've uh, they've just announced. Um, Mara, did I say that right? <laughs> Hello, James. You, you said it very, very, very right. Uh, um, if Kevin is here, I think he's, he's uh, better equipped than me to explain the, uh, the announcement. Um, yes, hello, uh, Kevin. Kevin McCarthy here. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Could you could you both turn on your uh, your videos as well? Um, my one will not work because don't, only, don't worry. Don't only worry. recently, after five resets this morning. I might be able to get back online, so apologies. But um, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to colleagues. Uh, very happy to join this. Um, we are uh, in an exploratory phase within the Commission um, because we want to understand what is the best pathway we can actually uh, explore. Um, we know there are enormous challenges to just um, setting up any kind of um, production. Um, and these go from, and I don't need to go into to the details, but um, you, you know, do you have the correct, proper, encouraging, enabling environment? I, uh, is the business plan accepted? Is there quality assurance? Is there sufficient regulatory and enforcement um, uh, capacity? Uh, is supply chain um, out there? Um, what is the role of um, the, 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 the science, technology, and innovation community within the country or group of countries? So we, we know there's an enormous um, 
number of factors, very complicated factors that need to be taken into account. So we are exploring with stakeholders, in particular WHO, um, in, in, the, in this area. Now, um, we don't necessarily focus uh, on just the vaccines. We would look at general pharmaceutical products, health products generally, and um, explore the, the, the different possibilities. We know too that um, it is not all countries that can qualify um, or be in a position, but it is of crucial importance that um, there is the, the, the country buy-in uh, before any kind of planning or undertaking is, is possible. But as I said, we are working with, um, at the beginning of this, this roadway, this pathway, we're working with WHO and reaching out to our delegations in countries to understand where the appetite is. Now, um, this means that we would be also linking up in a Team Europe approach, what we call a Team Europe approach, with other European member states, other countries, but also other institutions, including the European Investment Bank. So we will see what um, we, can, we can explore. We know it's not a quick fix. This is medium to long term. Um, there's no point building a white elephant uh, that, 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 that can't function um, after everybody has gone home. Um, it needs to be of a sustainable nature. But this doesn't mean to say that um, we have all the answers. So today, um, it was quite interesting to understand that um, what a key question um, like, for example, what, what kind of vaccine are you talking about will actually determine the way you, you view the potential to invest in, 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 in potential local manufacturing capacity. As I said, though, we are not simply focusing on, on vaccines. Um, this may or may not offer opportunities, but there are other opportunities as well, not least uh, for um, PPE, um, that it's also of a, of a major concern in Africa, for example. I don't know if that's answered some of the questions um, or some of the points. Um, I'm sorry if I dropped off the, the meeting that was due to, to the connection. I don't know if Maya wants to add anything to that. Thank you, Kevin. Well, maybe I would like just to, to, to compliment. Uh, we, we saw that uh, the president of the commission um, a few minutes ago mentioned uh, that we are, as Kevin said, exploring uh, potential support to boost local production. But as Kevin well explained, this will require engaging with multiple stakeholders. And, and for us, it's also important to look at it from, from the perspective of the structural challenges that impede nearly 2 billion people globally from, from accessing essential, essential medicines. Um, we know that an effective enabling environment has to underpin the manufacturing base and, and the production capacity. And, and this involves um, a number of coordinated interventions uh, from support to, to medical innovation research and technology transfer to enhancing governance and regulatory frameworks to uh, enhance human resources, uh, offering incentives to the markets and um, improving access to, to, to quality data and uh, information sharing. So, so we want to do it in a very respectful and conscious uh, way. We are at a very preliminary uh, state, stage and, and that's why uh, we joined uh, this event and, and we appreciate all the insights that all the participants are sharing. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I just want to one, uh, one add a question before I move on uh, to the next topic. We're going to quickly move on to, uh, I'm going to be calling on Edward Hammond, um, Christopher Howard, Fred Abbott, and Kira Bailey next to talk about uh, manufacturing capacity. But before we do that, I'd like to ask, um, uh, the European Commission, th this concern about the white elephants, do you think that in the context of the developing world where the schedule of vaccine delivery is delayed and, and is expected to come later than it would be in, the, in, uh, in, in, in Europe, for example, or the United States or Japan, in, in, in those cases, is the concern about white elephants overstated? I mean, if there's a, a, a massive international, you know, global emergency, 
maybe maybe building some white elephants is justified if it's necessary to vaccinate the whole world, don't you think? Uh, James, I would agree with you, but um, I, I don't think um, I don't think a white elephant or a black elephant or a yellow elephant can be built in a couple of months or a couple of or even a year. Um, we've had it from Gavi that uh, they see five years uh, to, to, to ramp up um, production, uh, training, capacity, skill set, supply chain, security. It does depend what we're talking about. Are we talking about packaging or are we talking about primary production? Prim there, is, primary, there are a number uh, of questions. Yeah? yeah, primary primary production. I mean, one thing I would call attention to is that uh, um, I, I think what you said is really a, an important empirical question. Uh, Louise Abinader is as, as a spreadsheet on our, on, which is, I think we sent a link to it around, which list a lot of the outsourcing agreements that have been signed and it includes the time between the when the agreements were signed and when production came online so it seems like an empirical question as to how long it takes i know that pfizer for example signed an agreement with the united states government in july of last year that required pfizer to acquire messenger rna technology from biotech in europe and transfer it so that Pfizer could manufacture the same technology in the United States. So it was a country to uh, a country to co uh, a continent to continent, company to company thing. And it, it actually didn't, didn't take five years. It, it happened pretty fast. So, um, yeah, so I think that there's a, um, you know, I, we look at the, the timing issues is a, is a, in, in the, 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 the compression of time in, in, in when it's considered an emergency, sometimes things can happen um, a lot faster. I mean, it didn't take us five years to fight the Second World War, uh, and a lot was done. So, but I, I'm sorry, I don't want to be too argumentative. I'm just sort of throwing no, no, out. No, 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 no. I, I will definitely not stand in the way. I will help push the cart up the hill, no problem. But I think we need to be realistic. And to, to be fair, we are just at the very beginning of this uh, landscape uh, analysis. Um, but perhaps, I don't know, a colleague from WHO can give us an indication um, well, because there may be possibilities for certain factories, plants in Africa that actually are not locally owned but are multinationals that can ramp up um, production. So far, our intelligence hasn't included that information. Great. Okay, I'm, I'm going to rush to it. Uh, we have now a uh, uh, we're waiting for Martin Fried from WHO to join us. When he does, if somebody can ping me, then then we'll we'll make sure to get him an opportunity to share because he's uh, really has a lot uh, to offer on this topic. But in the meantime, I'm going to switch. I'm going to right now go to Edward Hammond, followed by Christopher Howard, Fred Abbott, and Tara Bailey, uh, to talk uh, um, uh, some of their insights about manufacturing capacity. Uh, Edward, do you want to? Are you are you? Can you turn on your audio and video right yeah. now? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I'm here. I, I don't know uh, what I really have to add beyond what has already been said. I'll, I'll just make a couple of very simple observations because I'm a very simple person in my approach to this, I suppose. But um, I think that well, well, first, <laughs> I've, first been you, trying to, I've been trying to monitor. See, I'm sorry. I just, yeah, just tell people a little bit about who you are and, and uh, why. Sure. Well, I, I guess I'm an independent consultant. I primarily work for Third World Network in, in this area, uh, which is an NGO based in Malaysia. Um, as you can see behind me, I'm obviously in Texas. But uh, the uh, I've been attempting to sort of track and map uh, manufacturing capacity since really the beginning of the pandemic uh, and have done so online at VaxMap. Um, I guess what I would say is just a few simple things that, that may have already been said, but maybe bear repeating. Um, probably the, I mean, the striking thing I think about uh, our knowledge of manufacturing capacity is right now, uh, our collective knowledge, particularly considering all the different entities that are on this call, is our lack of knowledge about it. Um, and uh, sometimes I, well, I increasingly feel as if, um, 
our lack of knowledge about uh, capacity is um, maybe linked to a couple of things. Uh, one is that you know the the information is tightly held within within industry, and uh, we are kept in a deliberate state of ignorance. Um, and uh, you sometimes you know we've been uh, surprised to to uh, when you when you think that maybe manufacturing capacity of a particular vaccine is tapped out, um, suddenly you know millions more doses are announced, and uh, it makes uh, it makes me certainly feel a bit angered at the lack of transparency with respect to, to what's able to be made. Um, I, I'll say, so, so I think that there is a, on, a, on grounds of just simple uh, demands for transparency and public accountability, you know, really grounds to pressure industry itself to be more transparent about what it's capable of doing and what can be done. Um, also, I think that um, we've been limited by uh, the fact that what information has been gathered um, is uh, our responses to EOIs. And even within that, we don't see disaggregated information on manufacturing capacity in the responses to the EOIs. So um, what is held by CEPI or, or UN agencies um, in terms of knowledge about specific manufacturing capacity is only that information that was really volunteered in response to an EOI, which might or might not be accurate or complete. Um, and then we don't even get it in the, in the public domain uh, in, a, in a form that is very useful uh, because, it's, uh, because it's all lumped together and, and we can't see what company can do this or that in, in what region. So, so there's a huge, lack of information and I think that there are a couple of things areas there where where it could be improved um, I guess the only other observation I would say now is something that we've sort of been hitting around so far in the meeting altogether before um, and that's that I think that the, the the available manufacturing capacity is is very tightly linked to the technology transfer environment right I mean obviously you know if mRNA vaccines continue to work there are some compelling aspects because you don't need, you know, enormous amounts of infrastructure and enormous, you know, bioreactors and uh, there's there's all sorts of compelling aspects of that technology. But it's useless to focus on that if if uh, BioNTech and Pfizer and Moderna are not going to surrender the information on how to do it. And I think that that information, as best I can determine, is really held in the heads and hands and sops of, uh, you know, a few, a few factories in a few locations right now. Um, and so that in turn, so, if, so if, if it is the case that we don't have uh, uh, a, an open and cooperative and, and productive, you know, technology transfer environment, then, um, then the, then the capacity situation looks a little bit different because you're gonna be relying on, different, on a different set of technologies. Um, I hope that's useful. That's, <laughs> that's really all I, can, all I can say right now. I wish that there were better uh, and easier conclusions to make. Um, I do think though that, there, that, that the holes in our knowledge about what's possible are um, deliberate <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and that, we can, that we can come to a better understanding uh, if, if, if pressure is applied for, for this information to be more publicly available. Uh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed that, that, that intervention. Um, and, and I think everyone that's looked at your website has really found that informative as well. Um, so uh, um, uh, I'd like to call on uh, Christopher Howard now from NRL Enterprise Solutions. I don't know. Christopher, but he's one of the persons registered, and I think he works in this field. Uh, Christopher, I, are you, yes, are you able to introduce yourself to the uh, the audience a bit? I will. I'll switch my uh, my video over to the other screen. Sorry, so I'm actually looking oh, into the screen. This, no, this okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name's Chris Howard. Um, I spent about ten years working for. Merck, uh, Merck and Company, Merck Sharp and Dome, depending on which part of the world you're in, um, designing and building vaccine facilities. 
um, and also doing technology transfers into middle income countries. Um, and then I've spent the past eight years working uh, as an independent consultant in the manufacturing side of things for various organizations around the world, both multinationals and um, NGOs. So yeah, I just have a few things to, to offer based on some of the topics that were just on on the, uh, the call. So I, I think one of the biggest um, bottlenecks we have to expanding production capacity is know-how. Um, so we can free the IP as people like to say, um, kind of all you want, but I liken it to going to a, uh, a three-star Michelin restaurant and um, having a meal and asking for the recipe. Um, I'm not going to be able to recreate that meal uh, with that recipe, and I'm certainly not going to be able to run a, a three-star uh, Michelin restaurant without all the other knowledge that goes into delivering that uh, that meal and that experience. So um, I think that's what, unless you've done technology transfers in the past um, and involved in that, um, I think that is kind of oversimplified sometimes. Um, and there's just a finite number of people who can do those types of things. So um, you may have a, a single facility or two or three facilities in the world. Um, and there may be a few dozen people who know how to run the process um, and how to scale the process and how to run the process at commercial scale. Um, and when they are all hands on deck in those facilities, trying to keep those facilities running, uh, it does make it very difficult to put them on a plane and help them to, to transfer that technology elsewhere, especially when travel is so restricted. So um, people are definitely gonna be a huge bottleneck here. Um, you can buy facilities, you can set them up, you can send SOPs, you can try and have Skype meetings, but I've done this for the majority of my career and it's very difficult unless you're there and you're able to be dedicated to it. Um, could I, Chris, could I ask you a question? I, uh, we had this, uh, this uh, discussion with some companies about technology transfer. My journalist said, look, at, we've got 1,200 employees. We're all focused on delivering vaccines. We don't have time to run around the world getting to know companies and you know, working in different languages or training people how to do things, even if we wanted to. And I've heard this from other, other companies. It's sort of the, it's, it's, a, it's a resource intensive issue doing technology transfer in terms of personnel. So one of the questions people explored is, could there be uh, intermediaries that job was not to manufacture anything, but to be a, a go between between the originator of the technology and the receiver of the technology. And we raised this with CEPI uh, and, and CEPI said they in fact did that but they did it just within their own team. They did it within the CEPI membership. They they would they would uh, they had con consultants and experts who would work together with an originator and a, and a, and, a, and someone that would be outsourced to sort of do the job about that. Um, but they weren't doing it as a standalone basis, so maybe they could. Do you think it would be useful for you know the WHO, uh, Unitaid, CEPI? Uh, Operation Warp Speed, whomever was sort of committed to this, if they really were committed, to resource and fund people like yourself and other experts around each particular technology to be kind of a, uh, a team that could go out and assist on the, on, uh, on the technology transfer that would gain the confidence of both the manufacturer, the, the originator, and, and the other people, and we're really expert on these issues of uh, good manufacturing practices. As much as I'd love from a, a business perspective to say yes, um, I could certainly go and do that. Essentially, what you're doing is you're creating a copy of a copy um, and you're losing some of the fidelity there. So, um, you know, me going and learning how a Moderna or a Pfizer project works, um, I, you know, I have to spend months there to even get reasonably trained to be able to then go and do that somewhere else. Um, but the other thing is each of these companies have their own context and own way of doing things. So I know when I've done projects for Takeda or for Pfizer or for, uh, you know, coming from an MSD or Merck background, we did things very differently. So I could walk into another Merck facility and say, oh, yeah, this is typically how we do this process. 
um, and another company can do it completely differently. So a lot of that experience and, and culture and, and context is baked into people's experience. And that makes it difficult to do a technology transfer in the first place because you're, you're taking one company's way of doing things and transferring it to another who may already do it differently. But now you're putting an extra buffer in the middle with someone who may not be familiar with either of those cultures trying to do that translation. Um, well, so I'm, <laughs> that is a really useful uh, bit of uh, perspective for people because I think people need to be grounded in, in, in just how challenging these things are. I will say, I'll just repeat that um, Seppi says they're already, in fact, doing that. So, it, it, you know, at least they think they can do it. Um, I'm sure you can do it, but it's not the same as having the people who develop the product and, and people able to do I'm it. Sure it's not, I'm sure it's not yeah. as good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think the other, I think, sorry, I think the other problem there is there's only a finite number of experts in the world in general. Um, and so it's sort of like, if they're already all being pulled in, and I mean, so many different directions. I, I'm getting calls two or three times a month saying, I have this project, can you come and work on it? And there's just not enough people out there to do all the work that's needed. Listen, I, 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 this is great. I, I have to move along because we're, uh, we're on, yeah. we're, we're part way through agenda item three. And uh, uh, I think I'm really glad you joined this and thank you very much for sharing that. I'm gonna go to, Martin Freed from uh, the WHO, who's been in and out because he has conflicting calls, and we're really happy to have him. And I'm going to take him uh, right now, if possible. Uh, Martin, are, are you able to turn no, on your I'm, audio? I'm here and the camera's on, I think. Great. You want to introduce yourself and then offer your perspectives on... Uh, on uh, uh, the, the, Life, the universe, and everything. Okay, so hello. I'm, I'm Martin Fried. I lead the Vaccine Research Unit at WHO. And just a few thoughts. It's great coming up to Chris Howard. Chris and I have worked quite a lot together on trying to promote vaccine production capacity in Africa. And so I just like to come you know, back onto this and also to, to what Jamie just said and tell you what we did in the past for influenza vaccines. So after the 2005 uh, H5N1 scare, a lot of countries around the world said, not fair, we don't have influenza vaccine production know-how, capacity, etc. And we set up a technology transfer hub. So this addresses both the issues that, that Chris raised and also that Jamie raised of there being insufficient um, know-how for us to send experts to every single facility on earth that wants to learn it. Inst and the companies that are doing it, the Modernas, the CureVax, the COVAX, um, the BioNTechs, they can't open their doors to all and sundry all at the same time. And what we did was we set up a technology transfer hub. This was in the Netherlands, um, in Bilthoven at the old Dutch Vaccine Institute. And the, the full GMP process, the full manufacturing process was set up with SOPs and everything. And people could come there, learn the entire technology from start to finish, including all of the quality assays, the quality assurance processes, the, the entire manufacturing process, and then return to their facilities. Now, that was for egg-based manufacturing, which is a pretty, it's, it's a hundred year old technology. So we had a lot of experts that were able to weigh in and help set up the process. Now, the problem for the mRNA, which is, as I agree with many people, they say this looks like a very exciting technology. I think we must be careful. We haven't yet seen, uh, not only it's, we haven't seen its full potential, but we also haven't seen the full implications of it in the long term. But let's say we wanted to set up an mRNA hub, we would still have to find a handful of people that really know how to do this at the industrial scale. Now, if you'd asked me this two weeks ago, I would have said those people don't exist. But over the last two weeks, I have been talking to people that have the experience of doing this at medium scale. And so I do believe that this is an approach that the world could take which is to set up a technology transfer hub uh, where people come and learn the technology. But now comes the other little interesting thing of which technology, because there's the Moderna technologies, the BioNTech technologies, the CureVac technology, and there's other technologies which are not yet approved, but who knows which of these is going to be the best. And there's going to be IP in this, there's going to be programmatic suitability, thermostability, dose, cost, etc. 
So maybe before we launch this, we would need to take a look at all of the options in front of us and say, this is the technology that would be the most appropriate to transfer to um, developing countries, to emerging economies. And then also ensure that um, those countries know what the financial implications of setting the, such a facility up are. I do want to point out that it's a lot cheaper um, to set up an mRNA facility than a classical vaccine facility, um, just in terms of square meters of, um, of, uh, of, of um, class A and class B and class C environment. Um, so I'd, I'd also like to just say that I, I heard a few other people talking and I'm really, really encouraged by the level of expertise and depth of thought from all of the commentators coming in. And so, Jamie, uh, well done for this uh, for this um, round table. Over. Thank you so much. And that was really actually a really encouraging um, a bit of information. I think I think that's uh, that's a lot of food for thought. I'd like to call right now on Fred Abbott. Fred Abbott is an attorney. He's been working with the Open Society Foundation. He's worked with many national governments and UN agencies. Uh, he's a professor at. Uh, at both, uh, uh, both in Florida and at Berkeley. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Fred, can you introduce yourself and then uh, explain what you've been doing in terms of uh, manufacturing capacity in Africa? Yes, Jamie, thank you very much. And it's great to be with a lot of uh, old colleagues here. And I'm happy to, very happy to be following uh, Martin Fried because I think what I'm gonna talk about for a few moments ties in very well with what he was just talking about. So as Jamie mentioned, uh, I've undertaken a study uh, along with a team of pharmaceutical chemists and vaccine technologists and economists on uh, whether and to what extent financing is acting as a constraint on the establishment of manufacturing facilities in Africa. Um, and to, you know, very briefly uh, give you some of the results. I mean, basically, none of the big multilateral agencies, the World Bank, the IFC, uh, the various uh, development banks, and this will go to the foundations, whether it's Gates, Rockefeller, OSF, uh, or so forth, or the sovereign wealth funds, or the classical asset managers, uh, have been financing the construction of vaccine production facilities in Africa. Um, and I would say that largely goes to developing countries in general. So this completely has to put aside what's going on in the developed world, where you do have a tremendous amount of subsidization going into the construction of new facilities. Um, so as we looked at it, I mean, if you're just talking about vaccines, Part of the significant problem is the time frame, which Martin was just talking about, because the only existing vaccine manufacturing facility in Africa uh, is the BioVac facility uh, in uh, South Africa. And that's been in the works for 18 years. It, it just recently started commencing uh, commercial scale production of two vaccines, none of, neither of them having to do with COVID. Um, and it's not clear that they could transition uh, at all to kind of bulk antigen manufacture. There are possibilities for uh, fill and finish facilities, for example, Aspen and, and in Egypt and Morocco and elsewhere, you can do fill and finish, but that's not, I think, the gating item. Uh, a number of people have pointed out, and we were just had a long conversation about this two days ago, was to what extent mRNA might change that equation. Uh, apparently, you just need to install uh, sequencers that basically can run off the vaccine. I realize it's not that simple. Um, the 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 question though is, you know, what else, right? So there does seem to be a, lo a lot of mystery about. Uh, understanding A, the basic process, and then B, the kind of secondary aspects of actually bringing it to a finished vaccine dose. Uh, so that's one thing that needs to be studied more, but, but with the hope that then you could reduce the timeline from five years to one year uh, would obviously uh, be very helpful. 
uh, and, and might encourage the financing. A problem, obviously, from the financing side if, if, is if what you're saying is, you know, if you'll finance the production of the vaccine facility, but it's going to be completed in five to eight years, is that is that going to be addressing COVID-19 or are you looking further into the future? Um, ultimately, if you're going to make these facilities work, you need, you know, Gavi type COVID, uh, COVAX type offtake agreements. Um, there are people on this call will know that there's any number of different ways you can make advanced purchase commitments, direct subsidies, tax credits, and so forth to make things work financially. But at the moment, to sum it up, no one is financing these types of facilities in Africa. Uh, and the question is, will can advocacy change that, right? Can we change the financing equation? So I'll sign off. Thank you. Uh, Fred, <laughs> a bit pessimistic at the end, but thank you very much for that. Probably a bit of realism there, right? It's funny because in COVID, you sort of think that this is one moment when money doesn't seem to be an object for any, for governments, and yet it is. Um, Tara Bailey um, uh, is one of the persons registered who's done the work in that is, uh, um, on behalf of the, the, uh, the British government. Tara, do you mind uh, turning on your video? And she's going to speak on essentially the same topic that Fred was talking about. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and thanks to many of the participants in this round table who have contributed to the work that we've been doing. Um, we were trying to build on previous work uh, done by the Africa um, Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative, looking at um, manufacturing capacity across. Yeah, Tara, Tara could, you, could, you, could you just uh, just 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 uh, introduce yourself a bit so people know a little I, bit about you? Sure. Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, I work for um, the UK um, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, what used to be DFID. I'm based in Senegal. Um, where there is a small amount of manufacturing capacity in vaccines at the Institut Pasteur, which makes yellow fever vaccine. Um, so following a request from the uh, Africa Union CDC Special Envoy on COVID, um, Strive Musawiya, we, um, we started looking at vaccine manufacturing across Africa to see how it could be, um, how it could be expanded for COVID and for the longer term. So we've been working um, with many of the international organizations involved, like CEPI, Gavi, WHO, um, Gates Foundation, to draw on their existing knowledge. Um, I'm happy to share a link to the analysis that's been done so far, which sets out the um, vaccine demand landscape for the next 10 years, um, what manufacturing capacity there is, and, and looks a bit at the um, potential business models and the enabling environment. As, um, as many people have pointed out, it's not only is the manufacturing process very complex, but um, getting together all of the necessary bits in terms of demand, certainty, um, regulatory framework, um, the skills, the finance are all part of it. So I'm keen to, to know from others how they think um, we can best convene the international community to bring in all the different pieces. Um, in Senegal, we are working specifically to develop a, a commercial case with um, the ASTU Pasteur to see whether it's possible to do either any fill and finish or drug substance manufacture on COVID. And part of that means looking at what the um, most sensible vaccines would be afterwards. So you have to choose your COVID te um, vaccine technology partly in terms of what it could lead on to afterwards. Um, there is a lot of interest in finance, actually, we're talking to the development finance institutions and um, IFC, Africa Development Bank, um, EBRD um, in particular, are all very interested as our DFC. So I think that COVID has changed the perspective a bit on that and has changed the, the politics. Um, so I'll stop and hand over to those who've got much more expertise, but really I just wanted to flag that some of this baseline work has been put together and um, we're very keen to collaborate and, and bring in as many other donors as, as um, possible to talk about how to move things forward in the specific countries where there seem to be some opportunity. So thanks very much. Thank, thank you very much. I think uh, it's just really helpful for us to have uh, uh, two back-to-back -back presentations focusing on Africa manufacturing. Um, 
I'd like to, uh, uh, we're gonna, uh, we have a, really a, 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 a full agenda and a, a lot of amazing people. I think for some of these issues that deserve more discussion, we're gonna encourage people to, to uh, join the listserv and, and, and sort of sort some of these things out in discussions in the listserv. What I'm gonna do right now is jump to the next topic, which is what the WHO pre-qualification program is doing regarding vaccines. And in this area, Mary Angela from WHO has already given us a very good presentation. So we've ha already had that. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Gopa from the Third World Network if he could uh, share his thoughts on an abbreviated uh, regulatory pathway for, for vaccines. Uh, Gopa, are you, are you yeah. online right now? Are you yeah. ready to speak? So thank you, uh, uh, Jamie, for, uh, for this round table. I think it's a very uh, quick uh, uh, intervention. Uh, whether, uh, you know, we, we do have the CTAP uh, facility and... Uh, way, go, uh, go for, I mean, like, uh, this is a pretty diverse audience. Uh, so could you first explain a little bit about yourself, just so people get you... So um, I'm, I'm Gopal Kumar. I work with the Third World uh, Network, and mainly uh, I work uh, on access to medicine related issues. Uh, so here, uh, you know, we had a uh, CTAP consultation two days ago. So I had a presentation on the issue of uh, an abbreviated, a possibility of an abbreviated pathway. So even though we do have the technology transfer, but the regulatory framework uh, treat the treat the uh, non-originator vaccine producers as part of the <coughs> originators. So therefore, the only way the, uh, the non-originators can cut short the clinical trial and other as uh, aspects and fast track the regulatory approval is only through obtaining the uh, technology from the originators. If, even though uh, many of them may have the uh, a technological ability to uh, reverse engineer or uh, or or you know to develop uh, their own way uh, that will not be recognized as an uh, as a kind of a you know what we call it a generic or a, a biosimilar sort of vaccine uh, the current regulatory framework does not recognize so there is no abbreviated regulatory pathway in effect so as a result both of them will be treated at par so this creates a, another level of barrier and entry barrier. So therefore, I'm, uh, uh, you know, the question is that whether WHO can look at the possibility of developing an abbreviated pathway for COVID vaccines, and uh, what are the scientific challenges? Uh, then I, I try to address those challenges. So that's a, a, a one way to move forward, and we are, uh, I think. Uh, WHO has sufficient information from the pre-qualification mechanisms to have enough information to develop such an abbreviated pathway. So that will can actually uh, fast track the uh, non-originator uh, production and marketing approval. That's, that's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a really important uh, barrier for everyone. And everyone, uh, 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 I think recognizes that the regulatory barriers is a combination of uh, the challenges of getting uh, enough evidence and enough cooperation from uh, 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 manufacturers to provide the information that people are comfortable with uh, uh, to work to the to give assurances that vaccines are manufactured properly and and to make sure that the standards are 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 not excessive uh, in areas which are not really material to the to the basic safety issues that people have. I know that we've had, we've heard, certainly heard complaints from some people that some of the, they've questioned some of the changes in, in the standards as whether or not they're, they're uh, um, uh, realistic in terms of uh, uh, the ability of some manufacturers to respond to um, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of the, well, I'm just saying that the regulations in some cases are thought to be um, unnecessarily complicated in some areas, but I, I guess I'm, that's not my area of expertise. I'm not going to argue that further. Um, the next area on the agenda is 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 on um, what the WHO COVID Technology Access Pool (CTAP) is doing to expand manufacturing capacity for COVID vaccines. 
and I, I, I should know, but I don't know uh, who from C, from CTAP uh, is prepared to speak to this. Is Erica? Are you are you the person that will be uh, coming on on this issue? Hi, Jamie. I was not prepared to do that, but I can. I'm happy to. I'm happy to share a few words about CTAP if you want. So what do we uh, are doing well, in CTAP? I, 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 I'm sorry. Just, just I've been asking everybody to to introduce sorry, yeah. themselves a little bit to people that don't, because a lot of us know you, but not yeah. everyone knows you. Yeah. No. Thank you. I, I I'm Erika Duenas, and I work in WHO. I'm leading the intellectual property team, and also the technical aspects of the COVID technology access pool, which is the CTAP initiative. So um, yeah, maybe just to share with you, as, as uh, Gopa mentioned, we, we recently had a, a consultation with civil society organizations about CTAP. We also had a, um, another consultation with the, well, more than one with the uh, private sector in order to encourage them to explain the, what is CTAP and how uh, this can be a win-win solution. Uh, for patients and and for them in order to to promote um, to promote access for all uh, um, through these voluntary mechanisms. Of course, CTAP is building on other initiatives like the medicines patent pool for the licensing, the the UN Technology Bank, uh, UNDP, and other organizations are are supporting the initiative as well. I think most of them are are connected as well they can feel free to to share a few thoughts but that's that's basically where, where what we are trying to do uh, promote these voluntary mechanisms that work inside the uh, the patent system and um, with the experience we had before of this patent pooling with the medicines patent pool we know that uh, the companies used the mechanism in the past and it was very good to promote access. So that's what we are um, trying to work uh, in parallel with this initiative. So this initiative is complementary to the ACT Accelerator or and, and other tools. So um, and other initiatives in WHO. So- Actually, uh, so uh, uh, Erica, could, could you, uh... Could, could you, I know that, uh, uh, and I share with WHO that the National Institutes of Health under uh, the Institute under Dr. Fauci has recently had a notice of a um, licensing opportunity for a, a new vaccine that they say is uh, potentially effective, but also very inexpensive to manufacture. Um, has the, has the, uh, uh, has CTAP uh, tried to engage the WHO, I mean the, the, the NIH in the United States with any of its licensing opportunities or to ask in their in their research and development contracts that they provide some some access to some of the technology that they're licensing. Yes, Jamie. Thanks for the question. We are in touch with the with the um, different governments, including the U.S. Uh, at the highest level, in order to to discuss. And of course, CTAP is in the agenda, and we are proposing this uh, this mechanism. We're also uh, working together with the, the, the co-sponsors of the, of the um, uh, CTAP initiative and the solidarity call to action. And they are discussing about what kind of incentives, uh, either tax or, or regulatory, or what can in, kind of incentives the, gov the governments at the national level can also provide to encourage the companies to join the initiative. And the UK government was also involved. We met several um, research institutions in, in the UK and, uh, and other countries, and now we're working to do the same uh, with others. Could, and could you could you could you share information on on, on the state of the talks with, say, uh, the, the developers in uh, Russia, Cuba, or, or or China in terms of whether or not they will be sharing their technology through the COVID uh, through the uh, CTAP? So far, I don't have specific information to share in relation with the, the companies. We uh, requested bilateral meetings with uh, many of them, but I cannot uh, tell you more details uh, at this stage about the specific discussions with each of them. Okay, uh, and, and uh, 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 thank you for 
for, for you know, it's a, it's a challenging sure. job. Uh, um, and I think the issue of incentives is probably uh, quite an important one uh, that needs to be explored further. Um, um, thanks a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to now ask, um, uh, I'm going to go just, just one step back on the regulatory issue and ask, uh, uh, Bob Rizzo, uh, you mentioned in the chat, you had a, a comment on the regulatory issue. Did you, could you elaborate on that briefly before we go to the next agenda item? I'm sorry to catch you kind of unawares there. <laughs> um, and thanks again, Erica. Um, well, um, I, I'm going to come back on the regulatory issue later, but I, right now uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Charles Gore uh, from the Medicines Patent Pool uh, to discuss this issue of what the Medicines Patent Pool is doing to expand manufacturing for COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, Charles, like, like the other people, I'd like to ask you to turn on your video and your audio and then introduce yourself a bit for people that, that, you, you know, that don't know you as well as we do. A uh, little bit about both about yourself and the medicines patent pool, and then and then maybe give it and review some of the things that the medicines patent pool is doing in this area. And what, right, and also what you think the the, the challenges are, because obviously there's 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 some concern that uh, there has not been sufficient licensing in, in this area. Go ahead. Great, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jamie, and uh, thanks for inviting us um, to take part in this. Um, so my name is Charles Gore. I'm the executive director of the Medicines Patent Pool. And as many of you will know, but maybe not all, um, the Medicines Patent Pool was set up by uh, Unitaid uh, in 2010 to um, facilitate access to affordable but high quality uh, medicines for HIV in low and middle income countries through uh, patent pooling and licensing by um, asking the IP holders to give us licenses that we could then sub-license to generic manufacturers who would produce affordable uh, versions of patented drugs for low and middle income countries. And um, when um, uh, COVID um, appeared last year, um, our board uh, asked us to uh, expand our mandate, which had started with HIV, then expanded to Hep C and uh, TB, and then to uh, essential medicines more generally, but this time to expand to, to COVID uh, and really any technology that could be of use. And um, our experience and expertise has primarily been around, uh, well, in fact, exclusively been around therapeutics uh, rather than vaccines. So it's not an area where we have a lot of experience but up to a point licensing is licensing and there's no reason that we couldn't be of assistance uh, for that as well and we are, have also done some tech transfer in our agreements although not complex tech transfer and so we we offered our services to the the global community and uh, very pleased um, to offer to be a part of CTAP as a, uh, an operational partner uh, in that. Um, and so uh, to your question of um, what we've been doing, um, as I said, we, um, you know, this is not particularly our area of expertise. So we've wanted to work very much uh, hand in glove with organizations that uh, do have that expertise, whether it's CEPI, Gavi, WHO, but nonetheless, we have reached out to uh, IP holders in this area. Uh, but to be frank, we've not really got anywhere. Um, some uh, of them have spoken to us. Some of them have not even spoken to us. Um, and they appear really not to want to engage. And the ones who have spoken to us have given us some reasons uh, around that. Uh, some of which may be um, more valid than others. Uh, but one of them, for example, is the added time that licensing might require. Uh, as Gopa so eloquently uh, said, there are significant 
problems with the regulatory pathway currently that will add extra time. Plus there's the time of developing uh, a biosimilar vaccine, uh, which may be able to be shortened, but these are the reasons they've uh, given. Um, the difficulty of, of tech transfer that's been discussed a lot here about the human resourcing um, of that. Um, plus it does depend on what technology you want to transfer and therefore the capacity of the recipient to really understand it. Um, some uh, three years ago, I, I had a discussion with an IP holder on a vaccine where they had done a tech transfer to um, a developing country and still after five years, the process was not really working that well. So there are, there are issues on the ability to receive the information as well as the ability to provide it. Um, and also th the other thing is that uh, there are concerns about um, protecting the technology if it could be used um, in other areas um, as a competitor to whoever is providing that tech transfer. Now, um, I think we have arguments um, as to how these, some of these barriers could be overcome and, and some of them you've already heard today, but you know, that's the situation. And what makes it difficult for us is the MPP is a small organization, there are like 30 of us. Um, our model relies entirely on a sort of win-win-win situation and trying to balance the different interests of the IP holders, the generic manufacturers and public health. And we don't as such have much or indeed almost any leverage with the IP holders. And so it's very much civil society, governments, and so on, who can provide that. Um, one of the, a couple of other things we've done, we did last year get together the manufacturers we currently work with, and they came up with this pledge offering their capacity to uh, the world to increase manufacturing uh, capacity. Um, and this was primarily around um, around small molecule uh, medicines, but not only. And we've now in engaging with a much broader range of generics around this to, to see their willingness as well as their capacity to take this on. Because one of the other things that involved here is that there may be some risk. In order to shorten the timeline, what you want is generic manufacturers to start development in some respects ahead of a license expecting to get a license rather than waiting till the license is in place and of course that's a risk for them if the license doesn't materialize or if the therapeutic or vaccine in this particular case turns out not to be effective so um but we're looking at that at the moment but i mean i think you know <sighs> A lot of this whole thing around capacity is super complex. And it is, as I said, there are these different types of vaccines, uh, the ability to do the tech transfer, uh, the ability to receive it, uh, human capacity, both sides. Um, one of the things that, that as we concentrate so much on COVID, we do have to be aware that we do not want to be taking capacity away from the production of other incredibly important public health medicines in other areas. We do not want to cut measles vaccine production or whatever it might happen to be in order to, to uh, deal with COVID. So, um, and the other thing is that one of the, the things we found in talking to our generics over time, over the last year, is that their um, opinion of what capacity they have spare changes over time. As there's a shift in, in what becomes important in COVID, uh, initially, you know, um, uh, monoclonals, for example, and then, oh, no, the vaccine rollout is going to make a lot of medicines unnecessary. Oh, no, the vaccine rollout is going to be really slow. We need to be now reconcentrating on therapeutics, et cetera. So that becomes quite a, a complex, um, a complex question. But I'll stop there, uh, Jamie, because I know that we're short of time. Thanks so much. 
I think this was really, really uh, a helpful presentation and giving uh, a, a big picture and a lot of context to the questions that are posed to you. I'd like to ask you, um, uh, I, I, I have shared a, uh, on the chat a link to a, an NIH license for a vaccine, which is not in clinical trials, but which is a, a favorable review from the uh, uh, NIH is under Dr. Fauci's institute at the NIH. And Dr. Fauci has been quoted in the U.S. press as saying that he's in favor of the U.S. joining CTAP. So uh, 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 what has the medicines patent do, pool done with respect to reaching out to the NIH about this particular licensing opportunity? And the second question related to this is what is the, uh, what is the medicines patent pool done to reach out to the Cubans on their uh, vaccine technology. Because the Cubans have been saying in the press that they intend to make this available and it's a public health approach to them, not, not uh, a commercial approach necessarily. So some of the issues you raised about uh, companies wanting to hoard their technology for commercial things may or may not be the case uh, in terms of the Cuban um, a sub, uh, sub, uh, protein subunit vaccine. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Yeah. yeah. Two questions. two questions. So uh, with the NIH, um, certainly uh, we've contacted the NIH, but again, because we don't feel that we have the expertise to assess whether a, a vaccine is, you know, a good candidate for licensing. We don't want to be licensing uh, any, any form of, of technology that is suboptimal if there's something much better right there as well. Um, so, um, we've talked to, to CTAP about this and we are there to support them with the licensing. But let me just, uh, just because I work with the NIH a fair amount, they will make a decision soon whether that is licensed on an exclusive basis worldwide to some big, you know, sort of white heat of capitalism type company associated yeah. with it. Yeah. And if you try and then talk to that company that gets the exclusive license, it's going to be a tough conversation for you. But right now, they haven't made that decision. So if they, if, if, if you're in early, what you do is you have an opportunity to argue at least for a field of use or a geographic area of use or something like that uh, as an option or some something. But if you wait, if you wait too long, it's just a completely different conversation. Talking to the NIH about about their technology now is just easier than talking to the company that gets an exclusive license later. Yeah, Jamie, I told you, we have reached out to them. We are in email correspondence with them about this. On top of which, two weeks ago, we did a, a presentation to uh, essentially all the separate technology transfer offices in NIH about our model, about this, about asking them to come to us with any technology that could be useful. So we are, we are very much in, in contact with NIH. And this is the second presentation we've, we've done to them in the last year. So we, we're really trying to promote that. And I agree, but I have to say that until recently, perhaps the political situation in the US wasn't as favorable as hopefully it's now become. Uh, great. I, I, we have a, con uh, a conversation with HHS next uh, next week on this on this particular issue. That's great to hear. That's actually good. And on the issue of the Cuban um, uh, candidate. Sorry, on the issue of the Cuban. With that, uh, we're working with CTAP on that. We pass that over to them. Where we're, we're uh, sitting with them on this. They have much more. WHO has the expertise that, that we don't particularly have at the moment. Thank you. One, one, one just issue in the Cuba thing that we haven't really talked about very much is are, are the issue of sanctions something that come into anyone's uh, realm as an issue when it comes to Cuba? Because I've, I've heard, you know, we've heard from other people saying that because uh, we've, uh, you know, we've talked to set people, to talk to people, we're aware of the fact that, that, the, that, that the US sanctions has created a chilling effect on some collaborations with the Cubans. And I just want to know if that's been an issue for the medicines patent pool. Um, we have, sorry, I had my video off. We have uh, come across sanctions before because some of our licenses have allowed us to sell into sanctioned countries. 
And it's just, it's a question of getting a waiver um, that the IP holder has to uh, provide. So we've actually so far not had a massive issue with it, but, but clearly doing it the other way, receiving something from Cuba, we don't have any experience of yet. <laughs> I'm going to finally let you off the hook, Charles. Thank you very much. I, I know I've been kind of uh, pressing you. Um, no, that's you. fine. That's fine. Good. It's good to be pressed. Thank you for doing so. We're doing our kind of uh, uh, civil society pressure thing that you, that you tell us we have to do. So, um, so our, our next topic is uh, what national governments are doing. And um, uh, we've, we've heard a really, I think, a really good presentation from the European Commission. And we're really grateful for that. And uh, we have a presentation from Theo Cruz from Marco. Are you a uh, Krager? Uh, are, are you still with us? I know it's, we're almost at the end, end of our scheduled time. I hope you're still with us. Do we have Marco still? From Theo Cruz? I don't believe we do. We lost him. It's my, that's my bad on that. Um, um, are there, are there, uh, 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 well, uh, I'd like to ask Ariana uh, for a minute um, if you could uh, uh, if you could speak a bit about what's going on in Canada at this point, and if you could also like everyone else, if you could start by introducing yourself a little bit. And Ariana, for those who don't know her, uh, worked previously with Ellen Tahone, and uh, and she came to us through a uh, uh, recommendation of Ellen, and she's uh, lives in Calgary, Canada, and she's. She is uh, also the person that put together the spreadsheet, which many, uh, some of you have seen, which uh, uh, has tried to identify uh, companies that are currently involved in manufacturing, or we think may have some capacity in that area. Uh, Ariana, are you able to? Yeah, of course. I can I can say a quick quick thing about it. Um, so the Canadian government has invested. Well, I think Jamie has properly introduced me, but at the moment, I'm a I'm a researcher at Knowledge Ecology International. And my focus the last few weeks has been on uh, understanding global manufacturing uh, capacity for vaccines, both with regard to COVID as well as a little bit beyond that. And uh, on the Canadian front, the Canadian government has invested in a facility um, <clears throat> called the Biologics Manufacturing Facility, which would I think is slightly delayed in construction, but will hopefully be able to produce um, have some vaccines in 2022 at the beginning of the year. Um, but they'll be producing the Novavax vaccine. Um, and uh, they'll also have the likely have the capacity to do some small clinical batches of other platforms. I would just um, want to ask uh, uh, Ariana, one, one question is uh, Canada is setting up a, a um, public sector manufacturing facility for vaccines. To what extent is Canada able to, to provide technical assistance to other governments or other commercial entities about how to manufacture the same vaccines that their facility is being established uh, to manufacture? Well, the Canadian government has invested in the construction commission and the qualification of this facility, but uh, as for the technology transfer, they're getting all the information from Novavax, the licensing from Novavax, for example, um, for exactly how to make the, uh, the Novavax vaccine. But as, as it comes to more of a, a, government, um, a government facility, they might be able to have some insights in, into that regard. But when it comes to the specific technology transfer of the vaccine, I'm not sure if they would have any additional insight that others would not have. Um, um, thank you. I'm gonna because uh, we're 10:52. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch right now to the last topic, which is it's listed as what mistakes were made in 2020 and what mistakes need to be avoided in 2021. And I think that uh, I think some people I think. Uh, uh, would prefer the title Lessons Learned, which I think is a little more neutral. And um, uh, I, I, I intend to call on uh, five people uh, in succession here, starting with Peter Singer, and then 
um, and then Moga, uh, then Ellen Tahone, then, uh, um, then Mark Manuel from MSF and Brooke Baker, Baker from Health Gap. I'd like to start with Peter Singer from the WHO. And thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. Well, Jamie, thank you. And thank you. I, I actually wanted to thank you for your uh, wonderful stewardship of this call and, and the issue and thank all the colleagues on the call. Uh, I've really learned so much in the last couple of hours. And uh, I don't have the technical expertise of my colleagues, Mary Angela, Martin, and Erica, who you've heard from. Um, but I do think one of the lessons from last year, shall we say, is the need uh, for us all really to work very closely together because at the end of the day, vaccine equity is probably the defining, if, if solidarity was the key lesson of 2020, vaccine equity is probably the defining challenge of 2021. Dr. Tedros uh, and I work, I should have introduced myself, I'm his special advisor. And prior to coming to WHO with him, I uh, co-founded a bioethics center at the University of Toronto and co-founded Grand Challenges Canada um, and was a professor of medicine there. Anyway, Dr. Tedros um, has defined the situation as follows. He said, the world is on a brink of a catastrophic moral failure. So he really didn't mince his words. In fact, if you look at the data um, now on our world in data, about 89% of, uh, uh, sorry, 89 countries have initiated uh, vaccination. But if you, if you go to the pandemic uh, vaccine cracker, that's 74% in high income countries have initiated 37% in upper middle income countries, 22% in lower middle income countries, and zero in low income countries. So there really is an incredible inequity. As a result of that, Dr. Tedros and WHO have launched a 100 day challenge uh, and a vaccine equity declaration. And I put the URL in the, in the chat. And that was, so his call to action was in the first 100 days of 2021, uh, he's called on, uh, actually vaccination to start in all countries in the world, um, vaccination of health workers and other high risk groups. And today is day 50. So this is the exact midpoint, about 7,000 people and hundreds of organizations have joined that challenge. It does have a specific calls to action, including sharing manufacturing know-how. And what I would say here, Jamie, and just to wrap up, because I know you're short of time, is um, to invite everybody on this call to join us as an individual or as, a, uh, as an organization. Um, and I'll put the URL back in the chat so you don't have to scroll all the way up uh, uh, now. But this is obviously to end where I started, uh, a very important challenge that we all have to solve together. And, and in that regard, Jamie, thank you so much to you and, and to everybody on the call. It's been technically excellent and I've learned uh, so much and I'm sure we can work together to make uh, uh, well the progress that's needed on what's actually a very sad um, state of affairs at the moment in terms of vaccine equity, uh, catastrophic moral failure, the brink of a catastrophic moral failure to use Dr. Tedros words. Thank you, Jamie, and, and thank you for all this uh, engagement and interaction. Thank you so much, Peter, and I thank you uh, and we're really uh, it's it's really it's really uh, good that everyone is very impressed with the recent statements by uh, which in, in, in the eloquence of, of Dr. Tedros on this issue and his commitment. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask Moga, who who I think has to leave for another call pretty soon. Uh, who's uh, who? Many of you know. Uh, I call her for first name because I used to call her Dr. Moga Smith, and now I, now <laughs> I can't do that anymore. And uh, um, uh, many of you know Moga for her many, many years uh, of leading Oxfam's work on these topics. And uh, she's really one of the most uh, important figures in the access to movement thing for many years. And it's my, uh, my pleasure that she joined us for this call. And uh, she's working a lot on this topic. Moga, could you introduce yourself to the group and then uh, offer some comments on, on um, sort of the lessons learned or, or you know, you know, what we did wrong versus what we have to fix? Okay, thank you so much. You've been very kind to me. Yeah, I'm currently a consultant to NAIDS. I'm a kind of senior advisor to the People's Vaccine Alliance. 
So, um, so basically, I agree with you. It's mistakes made. I don't know if mistakes is more than mistakes. I don't want to say crimes, but something in between. But it's certainly not kind of neutral lessons that. So one thing is that it was clear, and I still don't understand why it wasn't, it seems that it wasn't clear for, for, for world leaders. It was clear that we will not have enough doses. It was clear that you wouldn't have the millions of doses tomorrow or next week or next month or whatever the, the date was supposed to be. Even when these countries have made the all these agreements for millions of, of, of vaccines, you know, see what's happening in Europe now. They can't provide for Europe, let alone developing countries. And you've seen all the figures. So this, this ignoring the reality, ignoring what's obvious common sense, you know, you didn't need a, a, a scientific data or a, a big research that takes its months to tell you that we won't have enough, enough doses. So, um, so ignoring common sense, about about supply still not tackling supply until now that is really really problematic so uh, you know doing bits the bitty the bitty nature of the global response one that every country looked after itself and the other thing is uh, let's have COVAX provide 20 percent of the population in these poor countries what about the rest where is the global plan to achieve herd immunity in every country. Because without that, um, you know, look at the mutation. If I was a world leader, I wouldn't be able to sleep, to be honest, with this mutation that, that one mutation is, is uh, threatening the whole of these vaccines that we have. What about if we have even a worse one? So uh, predicting supply, looking for global plan, that wasn't made, still not there yet. Sorting out the supply, still not sorted out. We have set up and we still leave. The, the third thing is governments are still happy to leave vital decisions on production, supply, who will have what doses when, and the price. They're leaving this in the hands of pharmaceutical companies at the time of a pandemic. It is just beyond belief that that one that they're still doing that. So this is the third mistake. That this has to be uh, corrected. And one way to correct it is to look at it. This is one way only to support CTAP to start immediately. Otherwise, last year we said, oh, no, we can't, you know, it will take ages to, to do technology transfer. This year we're saying, oh, it will take ages. Next year we'll say the same. And in 10 years time when we have another virus will say exactly the same. We have to start, even if it takes five years. If we start today, five years from now, we'll have, we'll have vaccines. But if we don't start today, we will delay it for another five years. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, and and uh, Jamie, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for all your work in this. And uh, the People's Vaccine um, Campaign has been fabulous and uh, uh, do a lot to uh, um, all of the people in the campaign, uh, Winnie, yourself, uh, Anna, Max, all these different people working on the campaign. It's been great. Um, I'd like to ask Ellen Tahone uh, to offer some comments. Uh, I think many of you know Ellen. She's uh, now become an academic. Um, she has a long history in the, in the movement with Health Action International, with MSF and with other groups. And um, she's also the chairman of uh, KEI Europe's board of directors, Ellen. Hi, hi Jamie, thank you. Um, can you hear and see me? I all of a sudden don't see anything anymore. Yep. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. We can all see, but, but introduce yourself. Uh, first. Okay. All right, well, almost everything that Jamie said is, is true, except I'm perhaps a bit less of an academic than he makes you makes you believe, um, but but I won't spend too much time on 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 talking about myself. I'm heading a group uh, uh, called Medicines Law and Policy that is a collection of of individuals that do research and advocacy work in this um, in this field. And in the past, I've worked with Médecins Sans Frontières and many other organizations, and I was the founding executive director of the Medicines Patent Pool and. Um, I was asked to say something about what went wrong uh, last year, 
um, and 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 what we we should get right uh, this year. Um, I think we should also recognize what went wrong sort of the last few decades because what I'm what I'm very shocked about is the total lack of preparedness uh, for this pandemic. But I'm sure I'm not uh, I'm not the only one. Um, I think a big mistake of last year is all the billions that are spent in principle fantastic on the innovation and the uh, the development of of important tools including the vaccines to combat this pandemic but not attaching the kind of conditions that are necessary to fulfill the promises that were also made of solidarity and of producing global public goods so you saw a lot of good words good text uh, a lot of promises, but then the actions, and particularly there where, where large amounts of money were, 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 were in, involved, did not, um, did not follow. Third, I think a naive real, reliance that the pharmaceutical industry would just deliver. I think Europe is waking up to the fact that that, didn't, that strategy didn't really work, um, and, and they're changing tack now. So these are some of the mistakes, I think, um, happened in 2021. Now, very quickly, what, what should, uh, listening to this meeting and Jamie and, and your team, congratulations, because it's been absolutely uh, an amazing two hours. Uh, but what I take away from it is um, we need to have, we need to insist on fully financing and getting up to speed as quickly as possible. Um, uh, Martin Frieda's uh, uh, technology transfer hub, and I think that hub needs to work together with CTAP and the medicines patent pool to make sure that all the tech transfer and the contractual, the whole contractual side of, of, of that um, is, a, is in order. But that seems to me a lesson, or at least that's a lesson that I'm, I'm getting out of these uh, out of these two hours, and as Moga said, we can we can always we can keep postponing things because it takes time and it takes effort. But if we don't get that in a, get that up and running, we will uh, continue to to say the same thing and nothing will happen. So, uh, with that, I hand back to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, great. And as usual, it was, uh, uh, you ended on a a, a very, a very uh, a constructive note in terms of like what we need to do right now. Uh, and those are very, uh, that's gonna really be helpful for people. Uh, Martin, uh, I, I'm sorry, Manuel Martin from MSF. Um, I'd like to ask him to share some comments. Uh, MSF of course is, uh, is, is it, over the years has been, has been uh, massively important in terms of advancing the interests of people in terms of access to medicine around the world. And they've been very active in raising all these issues of, 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 of vaccine equity. And Manuel, uh, could you offer some comments on um, what was done wrong in the past and what needs to be fixed uh, going forward? Thanks very much, Jamie. And thanks again for this fantastic panel and everyone at KEI as well. I uh, extend my thanks to you. So hi, everyone. I'm Manuel. Uh, I'm a medical doctor by the MSF Access Campaign. Um, I'll try to not repeat what other people have already said. Um, and I think, you know, you can always uh, talk about many mistakes if they're in the, pa in the past. Hindsight is always 2020, but I'll try and highlight four. Um, the first one is transparency. And I think this is particularly the case with the R&D funding contracts, such as the ones negotiated by CEPI. We don't know what types of margin rights they have, for example, something that CEPI calls a public health license for individual developers that they are supporting. And the only reason we know, for instance, about the unacceptable pricing discrepancy of the AstraZeneca vaccine between the EU and South Africa, where South Africa is actually paying more, is because the EU Commission failed to redact a contract. Um, and so that, that is really one of the big mistakes, not to ensure transparency in the last year. The second one is, I think, and this has been a number of speakers have spoken about this, that we didn't invest enough into the building capacity for technology transfer to the global south specifically. And I think this is particularly the case where RNA technologies are concerned. To my knowledge, the only RNA developer who has actively started the time intensive process of transferring their tech platform to an entity in the global south is Imperial College 
who has been working with the Clinical Biotechnology Center at the NHS and researchers at the Ugandan Virus Research Institute transfer their self-amplifying RNA platform. And just this week, actually, we spoke to CureVac, and they've been approached by both an Indonesian manufacturer and a manufacturer from Uzbekistan requesting tech transfer. And they have turned both of them down in favor of doing tech transfer to GSK because they don't have the resources to do it for all. And I think this capacity issue is an area that governments need to support. And that's why I was very interested, actually, in the technology transfer hub mentioned by Martin and Chris. Um, the third area that I would highlight is comparative trials. Um, I think we need a vaccine equivalent of recovery or solidarity. Uh, CEPI's made an important step of offering a centralized laboratory network to fairly compare clinical biomarkers of vaccine efficacy across different candidates. But to my knowledge, this remains underused and also as a result of this is also a result of no mechanisms which could be used to force developers to actually use it. And then the fourth one, and others have mentioned this as well, is just the equitable distribution of vaccines. I think, unfortunately, the narrow and political commercial interests prevailed last year. And that's I, why we as in MSF really welcome the very clear and public statements made by high-level officials at the WHO on this topic, like Dr. Tedros and Dr. Ryan, on the importance of vaccine equity. I think the new variants which reduce efficacy are set back, but they're also an opportunity for companies and countries to do the right thing and supply second generation vaccines equitably. I'll stop there and many thanks again uh, to KEI and Jamie for this fantastic event. Um, thank you, Manuel. I, I, was, uh, I think if people, uh, if they are on Twitter, they should definitely follow uh, Manuel. He's a, he's a really one of the more insightful people that you'll find in the global health community. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Brooke Baker, who's been um, uh, an absolute voice of uh, moral authority on the issue of uh, access to medicine issues for decades, and, uh, uh, and who's following this issue very closely and always has very specific and concrete uh, suggestions. Um, uh, Brooke, could you, if you're, I assume you're still on the call, um, are you able to? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm here. Uh, yeah, make some comments of what was done wrong in the past, uh, just because we don't want to let people off the hook for things that or mistakes were made, but then looking forward, what needs to be fixed. Okay, well, if we have a couple more hours, we can we can go through what's gone wrong, but I'm going I'm to try to do it very quickly. And of course, many others have already as well. I'm a senior policy analyst for Health Gap, uh, an AIDS activist organization, but also a law professor at Northeastern University. The biggest mistake was business as usual. Full stop. Uh, we assume that leaving things exactly as they were in terms of prioritizing national interest and allowing uh, big pharma to, to basically make all the important decisions was going to produce a solution to the global pandemic. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, and we learned some things that we hadn't even learned in the AIDS pandemic. We learned the disastrous consequences of IP right holders control not just respect with respect to high unaffordable prices, but inadequate artificially restricted supply and totally inequitable distribution uh, at the end. And, and so we've learned lessons a very hard way uh, that if we, if we continue down this path, we're gonna get the same thing over and over again. So there should have been a focus last March, which actually civil society tried to push on Production, production, production. That's why we pushed for CTAP. Uh, that's why we started uh, making claims against companies as early as we could. That's why we started uh, to cry out against vaccine nationalism uh, because all of that acted actually to constrain the focus on the need to expand supply. Uh, I'm worried right now that we're turning to uh, uh, times, you know, face saving wasting time on face-saving measures. So for example, we have this pathetic uh, request uh, from Macron and of France that there be 5% donation of rich country supplies uh, to low and middle income countries. You know, you know it, it's just such a trivial response. It's such an inadequate response. And the idea of sending a few uh, doses of, of Pfizer's vaccine to low and middle income countries is, is similarly just mostly symbolic, not, not having any real effect, even on uh, frontline health workers. So we, we, can't, we can't do that. Um, we have Act A, which was set up 
uh, act accelerator set up as theoretically on the basis that we would have an acute phase of the pandemic, we could meet 20% of need, uh, and then the market would take care of itself. Largely engineered and, and constructed on, on a foundation from the Gates Foundation, all of which is proven to be wholly inadequate to, to what we need. Um, one thing which I don't think we've mentioned quite as much is that you know when you allow the companies to, to control what happens, uh, many of the products are not well adapted or appropriately adapted for for use in resource uh, poor settings. Uh, and so the MNR vaccines are, are really complicated to use because of cold chain uh, requirements and, and what extra work is being done to make sure that they're, that they're, they're more usable. So, I mean, I could go on and on about, about what's, uh, what's gone, gone wrong, but I think what they also have to do is basically, you know, you know say to co the countries, uh, if you think that letting companies control things is going to get us out of this mess. And if you think trying to take care of your own domestic population is going to solve you from the worst of the pandemic, both ideas are just totally devoid of reality. Uh, the, the pandemic, especially with the variants, as many people have, have, in, have mentioned, is going to come back and haunt us exactly the same way over and over again. We're going to have the cycle of the same mistake. We're going to have the same cycle of business as usual unless we break the model now. Um, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, Brooke. Uh, uh, that was great. I just, uh, we're going to uh, wrap it up right now. We were supposed to finish at 11. We're running just a little bit late. It's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy we're, we're, we, we got as much done as we, as we did during this call. People were very concise in their comments, and uh, the, I think the content was really uh, appreciated by many people. Um, we've, we, we, we think that uh, lots of things we're just weren't able to really do adequately on this on a call of two hours or it's so complicated. So we did set up this list sort of just on vaccine manufacturing on this narrow topic if people want to follow up on the more technical issues and including incentives uh, and, and, and some of the financial aspects as well as the scientific aspects and uh, are, are happy to move that conversation there as well as I'm sure it'll be discussed in a lot of other forum. I, I, from my point of view, the, the, the lack of transparency in, in this pandemic has been really unfortunate. And uh, the, the lack of solidarity, actual, the comments on solidarity came early and then they were just ignored. And so the lack of real cooperation, what has to be done. In the beginning, I think it's natural people were focused on innovation when there was no vaccine and no effective therapeutics. But it, 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 as Moga said, it, it was obvious that if you actually had a vaccine or vaccines, that the task of vaccinating the whole planet was going to be pretty challenging and just wasn't, not much was really done about that at the time. Um, I think that, uh, uh, that also the success of the innovation front has given people, some people, uh, a message in it, and you definitely hear this from pharma, they say the system of strong IP and proprietary deals really works well. Look, look at all the vaccines we have. And so one, one narrative that you have is that you don't have to change the business model. You don't have to change the whole system. You just give a lot of money to, big, to, to companies, allow them to privatize all the government funded research and uh, control the technology, the manufacturing know-how, because uh, look at all the vaccines we got. And, and there's some truth to that in the sense that we did get a lot of vaccines and the innovation has been impressive, but we're hardly out, out of this crisis. And so really thinking and rethinking how to do the manufacturing scale up is, remains a really, really big point. And also I think people were reflecting more even on the innovation model going forward. But I'm going to have to bring it to a close. I didn't get a chance to introduce most of the KEI staff that have worked on these issues, including them. Uh, our lawyer, uh, Catherine Artisan, uh, including um, uh, Louise Gill Abinader, who's done a, a, an amazing amount of work. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kavian, <laughs> he's got a six syllable last name. Uh, Kulissa Badnaradhan. Yeah, Kulissa, yeah, exactly. Uh, who used to work with uh, who used to work with uh, 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 
the um, uh, I used to work with, with, with other groups, Ariane, Ariana Schutten, who did speak briefly, uh, Victoria Magrini, who's been working uh, with us uh, from Italy. And, and uh, I should have, if I had time, I would have had her talk more about what's going on with the Italian vaccine uh, development. Uh, and through Bala Subramaniam, uh, who, who runs our Geneva office and played a critical role, uh, as well as uh, Mano Rest, and uh, Claire Cassidy, and Claire Cassidy was the person that really is, uh, is, 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 is does everything from research to the to making the trains run on time in terms of the technology, and about fifty five other things at KEI, and is is really uh, important. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and close out the. Uh, uh, then I think I think I think uh, Claire has the kill switch, so I'm going to leave that up to her. I right, thank um, you, everyone.